People and animals are dying as a result of redundant scientific ideology. The practice known as vivisection is supported by a network of institutional and corporate interests. In Sydney, Australia, a group of people have campaigned for its abolition since 1987. They are people against vivisection. something that we've got no right to do, it's a total abuse of our power. Gruesome. No, it shouldn't be allowed. I don't like to look at it. Um, I don't know what we're actually getting out of um, doing animal experiments, and I don't think there's enough published on it. I'm really upset actually, but I, mean, I suppose it's, it's a shock more than anything else. We are one to see through life's mystery. I think as a medical student in 1972, I was very turned off and I saw absolutely senseless and cruel experiments on, well not experiments on cats, cats with their spinal cord severed, just so that medical students could see a demonstration of a cat being dropped on the ground. People could argue that some of it is necessary, but most of it is just academics indulging in their own little research trip and, and justifying it on that basis, which I think is false misrepresentation. It's really bad. You know how we've been waiting for Australian evidence? Yeah. Well, the word is getting around, and guess what I've got? Yeah. Oh, look at that. Sydney University. Yeah, inside Sydney Uni. Oh. Oh, that's horrendous. And that is in a human surgery. Uh, it's um, students practicing surgery on pigs which is outlawed in England, so... But allowed here. Yeah. I think other groups tend to work perhaps more internally. They have, um, rely more on their subscription-based uh, memberships, getting news out via magazines. They work with uh, politicians and together in that sense. Whereas I think, uh, and also to a certain extent less on the vivisection issue, they're involved in other issues. Animal Liberation, for instance, set up specifically as a uh, an organisation to uh, bring the plight of farmed animals to the general public. Other groups like SAFE started out on the fur issue, and I think um, PAV is the vivisection issue. So I, I don't think they're quantifiably different, except PAV is perhaps um, gaining a great deal reputation for being vocal on the vivisection issue, and I think that's why it's seen as different, because perhaps the issue is so strong. Also, I think that vivisection is a really contentious issue, and it creates a lot of debate, whereas the other issues, there's more or less a tacit acceptance that um, Furs are bad. There's a tacit acceptance that uh, things like steel door trap and duck coalition, duck season are bad. Um, vivisection is a really contentious issue because people really think lives are in danger, that we're all healthy because of vivisection. And it's this trying to debunk a myth which is the hardest thing. That's why they, I think they appear most vocal. You know, we even have a situation in this country where animal rights people um, parrot others in the movement, namely Peter Singer. Um, and he's always saying through the media that some animal experiments are necessary, which is an absolute outright lie. And of course people look up to him and they think that you know, he's known as the animal rights guru, so if he says that animal experiments are necessary, they must be. But whenever you ask those people what experiments they might be, they haven't got an answer. At the International AIDS Conference in Florence this year, the seventh conference, um, we were actually invited, AIDS activists, the International Act of Chapters gathered there, were actually invited to take part in um, an anti-vivisection demonstration. And after a lot of debate, we decided not to take part in it. But the reasons for that range across the board. 
um, some of our members and chapters thought that um, the anti-vivisection agenda had no relevance to HIV issues and therefore was not something we should vote on. Um, some other members and chapters actually thought that there would be elements in their agenda that would actually hinder HIV research. Tactically, if you're fighting a single issue, you're much stronger and able to do that, and hence the coalition so we can actually share an issue, yet still be involved with our other issues, yet have a strong front on that particular issue. I think because of those, um, those issues that have been so strong uh, in the past, they've tended to segregate people. But now, because everything seems to be moving together, I mean, that we have a sort of relationship between the section, we have a relationship between health and agriculture, pharmaceutical companies, uh, with the environment, with chemicals to be used, are also related to the section. People are seeing that now as coming together more and more. That there is a greater scope for working together, and I believe that will. The time has certainly come. For over 200 years, the anti-vivisection animal rights movement has been fighting this battle on ethical grounds. And it's self-evident that the atrocities that the animals are suffering in laboratories are uh, just so cruel and barbaric that they should be abolished immediately. But the fact is, it's a scientific fraud because people are dying as a direct result of vivisection. Animals react differently to drugs and therapies uh, than, than do people and you cannot extrapolate results from animals to people without disastrous results. When you consider that aspirin kills cats, penicillin kills guinea pigs, arsenic is safe for sheep, to base the whole science on just these few instances alone is, is ludicrous. These are only a few examples of thousands. So what we have here now is a new anti-vivisection movement who can, it consists of people that are willing to sit down and study. It consists of professionals in the medical field, veterinarians, medical historians. Um, they're not now just a group of animal lovers that want to stop cruelty, but people that have looked deeper into the subject and want to stop it on scientific grounds because of the damage to human health as well as the damage done to animals. There are over 400 methods of research that don't involve animals and they're less time consuming, they're less expensive and they are accurate. What the research community is trying to tell people is that animal research is the only form of research that is available and this is simply not so. And what is happening is that people are donating to medical research without any knowledge of how that money is being used the money is being funneled away from proper scientific research and going into animal research. It's a waste of funds, it's deceiving the public. If you go up to someone who's a pro vivisectionist and say this is cruel, this is wrong, you know, these poor animals are suffering, they're just going to turn around and say, well, we're saving lives, which is a, which is a lie. Uh, they're killing people and we have to use those arguments to let other people know what they're trying to get away with. It's always the fear of uh, infiltrators coming in to the organisation and and uh, taking on responsibilities and trying to defraud the the, the organisation's main aims. And it's quite often that we get phone calls in from other groups or Faith is ringing other groups. We have problems with the uh, telephone being tapped. We have uh, with special branches inform has. Uh, been in touch with people against vivisection. There are people out there that are suffering as a result of vivisection and they don't even know it and someone's got to tell them. Well by targeting the individual we bring to light the exact experiments that they, that they are doing and by that it shows the public number one that these experiments are not only cruel but they are unscientific. We just don't go into it and start harassing vivisectors as we've been accused of before. We look into their experiments, we explain to people why they can't work, why they will never work. And by exposing it in that way, it brings it home that vivisection is happening right on our back doorsteps. It is happening, um, people least expect it. And they are, these they are individuals that are responsible for these acts 
and they should be exposed for what they are. They should be opening up their laboratories. If they've got nothing to hide, why all this secrecy? And we challenge them on that point. I think PAV shares the problems of all anti-vivisectionist groups, that they are morally compromised, intellectually confused and politically lost. Other people uh, in the animal advocacy movement often refer to researchers as uh, fraudulent, evil, sadistic creatures. I can't do that. I've met a few people in the uh, animal experimentation business that are, are real sadistic people, a very few. Many of them are very much like I was, or thought I was at least, very concerned, very caring about animals at one level, but very completely shut off about animals at another level. The moral compromise that, that weakens the anti-vivisectionist case uh, arises because the anti-vivisectionists are concentrating on just one aspect of what is a very complex relationship between humans and other animals. Uh, for example, they totally ignore, never mention the fact that pet owners will happily, uh, even with approval, have the testicles cut off their male cats and dogs or the ovaries cut out of the females, and that's vivisection by any standard. Uh, and yet it goes un uncommented on by groups like PAV. And the reason they don't comment is that their major political constituency is cat and dog lovers. And they mustn't, of course, uh, offend that constituency. Yet most people appreciate that their indignation about medical science is a selective indignation, and some, like myself, suspect that there's a real element of, of hypocrisy in it. That's the moral confusion. Uh, the intellectual confusion uh, comes from the fact that PAV and the other anti-vivisectionist groups are really trying to protect a vision of a Disney-esque fantasia world of harmony among animals. And in order to protect what is an unrealistic vision, they are forced to believe things and propound things which are just intellectually um, not supportable. They would... See, you use these terms and they all of a sudden they sound scientific and the public says, that really sounds like that's not such a bad deal. But what was really happening is what I described before. The pain and the suffering and the, the futility of all of it was right there, but not viewed. The regulations which attach to the Animal Health, uh, the Animal Research Act of 1987 of this state, uh, provide for governmental inspection of research laboratories and. That is a form of people's access because the government represents the people and so the government inspects on behalf of the people. That is usually used by anti-vivisectionists to uh, try themselves to gain access to uh, laboratories. Um, but it's really just part of the propaganda war. As long as the community wants medical research to go on, it will. But your question then becomes how long will the community want medical research and there is no sign yet that the community is, is prepared to live and die with the uncurable diseases. I have no problem with biomedical research. I think that each of us needs to push for more money for biomedical research. What we need to stop is the unnecessary tools, the unnecessary methodology, the tactic and strategy of using non-human animals in research. They will argue the intellectually insupportable statement that medical science has never helped anyone, um, that medical scientists uh, becomes a corollary, that medical scientists are mad. Stalin too. Nobody knows that though. Monkey is very active. He's patiently waiting to be injured. That's playing. Intellectually and morally, I have no problem at all countering uh, the charges that are laid at my doorstep. Protesting against cosmetic animal testing, PAV demonstrated outside Johnson & Johnson headquarters. Targeting their No More Tears advertising campaign, Mark Berryman and Faith Van Eck revealed the dark side to these seemingly harmless products. 
The two most common cosmetic tests are the LD50 and Dray's test. LD50 stands for lethal dose 50%. The Dray's test is carried out on the eyes of rabbits. These tests offer legal protection against being sued for allergic reaction. They are inaccurate and unreliable since all they prove is that direct or massive doses of a foreign or poisonous substance will overwhelm the animal system. In addition, they serve as a means to certify as safe many cosmetics and household products that cause thousands of hospital recorded poisonous exposures every year. A new breed of cruelty-free companies are now challenging this tradition. We believe at the Body Shop that it's not necessary to test on animals for cosmetic purposes. That include, we also believe it's un, uncarned, it's quite cruel and unreliable. Uh, animals are not the same as human beings and because of that the test results that are uh, extrapolated often aren't accurate and many times it's been proven that products which have been tested on animals haven't actually uh, shown the results that came out later when people used the products. Another thing we try and do is we actually try and make sure that all our suppliers have not tested on animals within the last five years. They have to sign an agreement that this is the case and we check on this all the time. So if in the event that a, a supplier has, for some reason, tested on an animal, then we will change suppliers. Um, if we can't find a supplier for a particular ingredient, um, because there are none that haven't tested on animals in the last five years, then we'll actually stop using that product. And that's happened in several instances where we've had to stop production of a product because it had been, the ingredients or such had been tested on animals. Yeah. There are many alternatives to testing on animals, and we attempt to use the, the best methods we can. These are very scientifically based and often involve computer modelling or ITEX method, which is where the actual product is tested on, the, on a protein which is very similar to that of the eye. Now, we test in various ways on these scientific methods before we will then take it to human volunteers. We're also trying to encourage eco-labelling, and this will involve the listing of any product that it's been tested on an animal. Now, once this is placed on, an, on a label, we imagine that a lot of consumers may be disinterested or less likely to purchase such a product. At the Body Shop, we've had against animal testing printed on our labels for many years now. And it's a stand that we don't just do because of um, fashion, but because it's something we believe in sincerely. While we try and use as many alternative methods of testing of our products as possible, we also try and fund different organisations or different scientific groups into investigating alternative methods as well. So not only is, is it a campaign about using the methods, methods that are currently available, but also about finding alternative methods for the future. So far we've done really well with the media. It's, I think it's really changing um, because of um, the professional approach that's being taken and because we have the support of doctors and physicians the world over. They're accepting us um, quite well, uh, especially with radio. Um, Non-commercial stations are fine, but when it comes to commercial stations we have this problem whereby what we are doing, in fact, is threatening um, multinational companies, the pharmaceutical industry, the tobacco industry, the chemical industry. We are rocking the foundations of what our nation actually rests on. On TV you'll see um, ads for um, drugs, painkillers. Now, when we actually get to do things on television, we are warned not to trespass onto this um, human damage um, premise because the, uh, they don't want to offend their advertisers. And a good example of that is um, recently we held a demonstration against Johnson & Johnson. They used the dreadfully cruel and barbaric outdated LD50 and Dray's tests. Uh, now we did an interview with 2UE and just prior to the interview the producer came racing out and was very concerned that we were going to name Johnson & Johnson. There was little subtlety in the message awaiting delegates. The vandals had used bright red glossy paint to immortalise their views on those who use animals to find solutions to human ailments. Nearby, a human protest, and despite a markedly similar placard style, the people against vivisection denied any part in the vandalism. I mean, as far as we're concerned, a fraud is being perpetrated on the general public. I I don't know that I would ever be prepared to ask uh, a human being to take a drug that was totally untried, that the toxic effects were 
unknown. I guess you could say that that's what the Nazis did in World War II. This is Bosch Animal House, a building the protesters claimed houses 10,000 animals, including cats and dogs, for use in what they describe as macabre and inhumane surgical procedures. The University of Sydney declined our request to see inside, saying simply that its closed door policy was for security reasons and to prevent further acts of vandalism. Pav claims it has proof otherwise. The kittens have had their eyes sewn shut. Um, sometimes they're shown, sewn shut for a period of a year or whatever, and then they've had the eyes unstitched, and recordings have been taken. That it's not uncommon practice to treat uh, squint in human children by closing the eye or covering the but eye. But mindful of public opinion, scientists today formulated new guidelines on minimising animal stress. Right. Kay Brown, Eyewitness News. People Against Vivisection's most publicised campaign to date focused on the practice of pound seizure, the sale of impounded animals to Sydney University for the sum of one cent each. Although PAV succeeded in stopping the practice at Campbelltown, Lane Cove and Sutherland, Blacktown and other councils continue this policy. PAV began their campaign circulating petitions and writing letters to aldermen and the local paper. When Blacktown Council ignored and even ridiculed their efforts, PAV stepped up their campaign with demonstrations, calls for public debate and a televised raid of council chambers. He's got a, a Blacktown City Council registration tag. Any name? No. This dog's been bleeding excessively from the mouth. That's very unusual. If it had been euthanized humanely and done straight through the vein, the likelihood of having any hemorrhaging at all is very, very rare. I haven't seen it in six years of vet practice. This has got a Campbelltown tag on it. That is a, I don't know what that is. It's like a bit of meat. This is what's as though it's a blue heel across. This would be a bit older. It's obviously been in the freezer. Sometimes puppies are being used. Um, McLeod at Sydney University is using puppies in one of his experiments, in his poisoning experiments. This is a common. The vast majority of the cats used at Sydney University, they are definitely experimented on. They don't have any, well, they hardly have any surplus that I know of. So I don't understand what these cats are doing here, unless they have already been experimented on. That was probably their, one of their collars. Is there a name in With an identification tag. No, this would be a university identification tag. In 1991, PAV called for a referendum on the issue. The Blacktown Advocate held a phone poll in which 2,435 residents voted no to the use of pound animals in medical research. 770 voted in favour of the practice. Blacktown Council refused to hold a referendum. That's just a little corgi. No tag. Living in Blacktown wasn't very easy for me because we were living very close to the dog pound and, and the issue was so close and it got very, the campaign got very dirty on the councillor's part. It got really rough to the point where my home was being run, run constantly. I had threats over the phone. Um, my house had been broken into and after the threats my car had been tampered with. Um, and that sort of led me to think that maybe it was time to just change location, have a fresh start, because 
PAB had been at that stage about four or five years in the same location and a lot of people got to know where I lived. Um, I consequently had a lot of dogs dumped on me all the time. I was constantly rehoming animals. People tend to think of you as an animal welfare organisation. Just dump them over the fence, she'll take care of it. And that took its toll too. I mean, it took me away from campaign work. And I just decided just very suddenly that I had to go. The Animal Liberation Front are depicted as radical terrorists who run around bombing indiscriminately. Now this is just simply not true. They are a group of people that have never been able to turn away from or walk away from um, what animals are suffering in laboratories and fur farms and in, through the meat and livestock industry. Um, they're people that are willing to take risks. This is Britches. He was taken from his mother at birth. His eyes were sewn shut and a sonar device emitting high frequency sound was strapped to his head. This experiment was conducted on animals because researchers considered studying the development of blind children in their natural setting inconvenient. After months of isolation, Britches would be killed. In such conditions, Britches could not have developed the way an average blind child would. In the early hours of April the 20th, 1985, 16 members of the Animal Liberation Front deactivated security systems at the University of California, Riverside. They rescued hundreds of animals, including cats, rabbits, pigeons, mice and possums. They found cats with their eyes sewn shut, starved rabbits and pigeons, and wild baby possums subjected to eye mutilations. They also rescued riches. People Against Vivisection and the worldwide anti-vivisection movement cite international corporate and political interests that form a powerful lobby, inhibiting public awareness of research practices and pulling censorship strings in the media. In the end, according to Pav, it all comes down to the dollar. Dr. Ned Bukmiki, a veterinary eye specialist from the University of California at Davis, said the experiment on britches was conducted improperly and was in flagrant violation of federal law. After five weeks of severe deprivation, Britches displayed extreme neurotic behavior. It took ALF members several months of around-the-clock care and rehabilitation to nurse Britches to health. He was then released into the care of an adopted mother. While Animal Liberation Front activities are minimal in Australia, they continue overseas now hampered by increasingly sophisticated security technology. Millions of animals continue to suffer and die as a result of experimentation every year, and thousands of drugs, dubiously declared safe, are released onto the market to medicate a culture in distress.